Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's meeting, tonight's broadcast from the Workers' Party of Britain. We've got a slightly different format for you this evening. Jyoti, our deputy leader, is going to lead a select panel discussion on separatism, nationalism and working class unity. So I will pass over to Jyoti and you can introduce the panellists. Uh, there are a few that are still to arrive in the meeting, so I'll add them in as soon as they turn up. Thanks, Jyoti. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, yes, uh, thank you to all the members who have joined in the meeting tonight and to our audience of members and supporters and others. Uh, welcome to tonight's meeting. We're trying something slightly different, as Rob said. Uh, if it works out, we'll do it on some other topics too in the run up to the upcoming elections, because, you know, there are quite a few things that many of our members are very passionate about and which are key planks of our current election campaigning. So this one was brought about um, because of a real upsurge in not only separatism in Wales and Scotland, but now a sudden outbreak of or flurry of activity from people wanting to create separatist movements in other parts of Britain, in, in other regions, essentially of England. And um, although on some levels it, it feels almost ridiculous to talk about uh, what's being proposed by some of these people, it's clear that um, for whatever reason, there are some sincere people who are getting suckered into the idea that maybe this is the solution uh, to the very real problems facing working class people. And on that basis, we really do need to address it. I'm very happy to have with me a really uh, able panel of Workers Party members who we're basically gonna be having a discussion tonight on this topic. Um, and before I bring any of them in, I really just wanted to talk a little bit about British history, because Britain as a whole has a whole history and quite a, a long one compared to most modern capitalist nations. Um, every part of our island took a different route to becoming part of Britain. Essex took a different route to Cornwall. Bristol took a different route to Liverpool. Um, Scotland, Wales, different parts of Scotland took different routes, different parts of England. They all have their separate regional histories, going back to prehistoric times, going back to the earliest days of settled agriculture. There are no borders in Britain which were stable, no state of being that was stable. There was constant flux coming and goings of different peoples fighting over territories between tribes or between feudal warlords. This was the state of being all the way from settled ag agriculture until the emergence of modern Britain, which came about um, with the Act of Union in 1707. It had been slowly developing towards that point, but from 1707 with the Act of Union, the British state, the British nation was created. And from that moment, the modern Britain burst forth. It set for, allowed the potential for a modern capitalist economy to develop. Okay, our industrial revolution, our scientific revolution, the enlightenment, you know, the downsides as well as the upsides of industrialization, all of that came about as a result of having one state across the whole island of Britain. And compared to other capitalist countries, we've been capitalist longest, We've had stable borders for the longest. So Britain is an extremely firmly established nation across the whole territory of Britain and its you know, surrounding small islands. Um, and I just wanted to put that out there because the fact that we still have regional accents, regional foods, these are, if you like, vestiges of our separate pasts. They're not an indicator that we're different peoples. We are fundamentally the same people in this island. And our struggle, we've been a capitalist country for the longest time of any capitalist country. Our struggle is clearly not a national struggle. Our struggle is a class struggle. The next stage of our development is from capitalism to socialism. And the question is, how do you achieve that? And the number one prerequisite for fighting for socialism is working class unity. And once you understand that, you can see 
why the separatist movements are getting so much funding. Because the capitalists don't particularly want to be divided. They're not really allowing themselves to be divided, but they very much want the working class to be divided. And that's something I want us to bear in mind throughout this discussion, throughout this conversation, throughout the coming period. And another warning I would give really is beware of fashion. Fashion is always pushed on you from outside, always. There's a, if something's suddenly a fashion and everyone seems to be talking about it and it's all over the media and social media, you have to ask yourself why? Where did it suddenly come from? And it always comes from the ruling class. It comes from the bourgeoisie. They've got, they got people who are paid to sit and push stupid ideas onto us. Ideas which might seem plausible on a kind of shallow glance, but when you look more carefully, you realize what a diversion it really is. So um, with that as a very brief introduction, uh, I'd like first to pass over to Tess. Uh, Tess Delaney, you will all be familiar with her. She usually introduces these meetings these days. She's a Workers' Party worker. She lives in Wales, over in West Wales, Pembroke. Um, and she has plenty of experience of um, some quite nutty separatism that's gaining strength over, over in Wales there. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, to me, separatism feels a little like uh, in Wales, particularly when I see people talking about it on Facebook and there seems to be quite a lot of anger at Westminster, which you can't blame. You can't blame people for feeling like that. I feel like that too. We're all angry with the Westminster government, right? Um, but it feels a little to me like people want to pull up a drawbridge. It's like um, they've got their castle. This is Wales. This is our castle. And we're going to pull up the drawbridge and we're going to leave really good comrades outside. Like none of you guys, you're all my friends, but none of you live in Wales, right? So you would all be in another country. Uh, and you're not only trapping yourselves inside and your comrades outside, but you're also trapping yourself inside with people who aren't so great themselves. It's not like Wales is full of lighter than light, lovely socialists all skipping around as much as everyone would like to think so. You know, we saw from the, the Panali protests and all those things that went on about the, um, the army base that had the Iraqi refugees living there. We saw that there's plenty of uh, racist intent in, in Wales, in Pembrokeshire. It's not like all the racists are in England. Um, it's not like all the rich people and landowners are in England. Wales is full of landowners. It's the farmers own loads of land. Um, so it feels a little bit counterintuitive to me to lock your friends out and lock yourselves in with some real undesirables when we've got so many good comrades in England, in Scotland, all over the place. Um, Wales is a funny old place. We've got really poor areas and we've got really rich areas. It, like I live in Pembroke and so we've got some really poor kind of industrial areas here. And then just kind of 10 miles away, you've got Tenby, where all the big kind of um, the very rich people live who own Tembe and own bits of beaches and own castles and and all this property. So there's a real divide. There are million pound houses that um, when I was an estate agent, I showed a million pound house to someone in Little Haven as a holiday home and they wouldn't buy it because they had to drive through the council estate in Broadhaven to get to it. You know, it's it's kind of like that. So um, interestingly, I'm running for the Senate and I've been filling in press questions and on the things they want us to fill in. They want us to talk about housing and transport and um, environmental things, all sorts of stuff. Not one has asked for any opinion on independent Wales. So that kind of Im implies to me that it's not the big thing that everybody says it is. You know, if you look at Twitter, you'd think that it's it's the big, the big issue in Wales. But nobody in Pembroke talks about it in real life. You, nobody, you know, you have got people in the shop going, oh, let's be independent. And then, like Jody said, how far back in history do you want to go? If you look at the Priscelli Bluestones finding their way to Stonehenge, clearly uh, someone at some point didn't have an issue with taking Welsh stuff to England. And... And that was, according to certain documentaries that you might watch or books you might read, that they do say that that was to do with um, bringing tribes together, you know, bringing the tribes from Wiltshire, which we call Wiltshire now, and Priscelli together for some reason. We don't know why, but that happened. So to, to kind of break a line down the middle because of the River Severn 
suddenly after the Ice Age becoming a slightly different shape to what it was before when Stonehenge made its way to Stonehenge. It makes no sense um, to me. These polls, we get a lot of polls coming out now. To me, they seem a bit suspicious. They keep going up and up and up and up. And Mark Drakeford suddenly is starting to say things like, well, perhaps we could have an Indie Wales. But, um, you know, he decided that like what? Like yeah, last Tuesday afternoon for some reason. What, because the polls change? Because some poll change? And where are these polls coming from? Are, are they coming from young people in Cardiff who are very disillusioned and looking for something? I know a lot of people... Um, who are very pro-Indie are a lot of my old friends who I was in the Labour Party with or who supported Labour when Corbyn was around. And it seems to me that everyone is so desperate for another Corbyn-esque thing to grab hold of that they'll grab anything. They'll grab Plaid Cymru, they'll grab the Green Party, they'll grab anything, they'll grab Indie Wales and, and they think that that might suddenly conjure up some kind of socialism like Paul Daniels, but it's not going to because that's not how it works. You can't build socialism in little pockets and it's a, it's an entire economic system. It's not going to happen. And um, just lastly, if it's, if it's all to do with getting labor into power, which is what they say, isn't it? That oh, we should all act together, the left, we should all act together, we should all get labor into power. I seem to remember back in the Miliband election, to be honest, I wasn't paying a huge amount of attention po to politics back then, but in the Miliband election, I think Labour would have won had it not been for the fact that the entirety of Scotland voted for the SNP and abandoned Labour because of Labour were being so kind of rubbish in Scotland. So they all kind of protest voted SNP and therefore Labour lost that election. It seemed to me that the numbers, you know, Labour would have won. So if that's all it was ever about, Labour winning, you'd have thought that socialists, in, you know, separatists would have done it then, but they didn't. They they voted for their own way. So all I can say really is, um, you know, just be aware and, and don't fall for every little thing that comes on the telly or comes on Twitter or comes on Facebook or social media because they just want to get you and they just want to make you believe something that will stop us all getting together and rising up as a big bunch because the more little pieces they can get us into, the less likelihood there is of us all gathering up together and saying, hold on a minute, should we sort something out here? Because that's that's ultimately what we've got to do. So, okay, thank you, Josie. Real, thanks, Tess. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, each of our panellists tonight and ask them to talk to you. And then we'll kind of open the floor for a bit more of kind of free-flowing free debate. So at that point, just stick your hand up when you've got something to say, guys, okay? Uh, so next we have for you Andrew Metcalf, uh, who is a fantastic one of our members and another one of our candidates. Uh, you'll have seen him speak last week from Durham. Um, you can't get more in the middle of the north than Durham. So, uh, Andrew, um, do you see much of this northern separatism in real life where you live, or do you feel like it's just a bit of a social media construct? Yes, uh, th uh, thank you very much, uh, Jordi and uh, Tess. Um, yeah, to be honest, uh, I mean, this is something that before the launch of the new Northern Independence Party was something that, you know, you, you kind of see it in the pub on a Friday night, you know, when you're all going home and, you know, you've all had a bit too much to drink and you say, oh, bloody Tories and the Westminster government and, oh, let's just break away from them. It's that kind of thing, but it's not anything that people really take seriously. Um, and people's identity is very much... Um, rooted in Britain and in England in uh, in the Northeast. And I think there's a, a real, um, how should I put it, there's a real um, uh, favourable attitude towards um, the Union instead of, say, Scotland, you know, where there is a sort of a, a desire for nationalism, or appears to be anyway. Um, but no, it's, I mean, it's just, it's, it's so ridiculous, but I mean, it's so ridiculous, but unfortunately, Yes, it will. Um, I think because of the media, I think because of people hyping it up, that's why it might become a threat. But it's it just isn't sort of something that comes into people's um, thinking in real in, in everyday life up here in the north. Um, and it's not the biggest question. Or the biggest question are things of housing, of jobs, of uh, of the future generally, which just seems to be so 
bleak, you know, from a lot of working class people's perspective. Um, and something Tess said before about um, you know people just being so desperate for anything, um, just desperate for something um, because of the failure of so much of the political establishment. Um, and there is this kind of this separatist sort of escapism that over the horizon there's a promised land and there's going to be um, how should I put it? Is this going to be sort of you know sunshine and strawberry fields forever? But I think I think it was Marx who um, commented on all societies having the uh, potential to capitalism and imperialism. And of course, as we know with Scotland, um, you know, there's plenty of landowners, plenty of the old lads, um, plenty of industrialists um, who will take up the uh, position of the English uh, West, Westminster centred um, financial class. And kind of, I'll, and I'll, 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 we'll stop talking now, I'll make this the last uh, point. Um, something that James Connolly said, which I, I think we all know the quote, um, that if tomorrow uh, you kick the English army out and uh, put up, and, and put up the, uh, the green flag over Dublin Castle, if you didn't institute a socialist republic, England would still rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords. And Ireland is a great example of where there was so much potential. I mean, a great socialist movement, great heroes like Connolly, Larkin, and that revolutionary spirit was so horrendously betrayed and where you had two sections of Ireland, one which was dominated by the rule of the Orange Order and another dominated by uh, the Order of Reaction and, and the Catholic Church. Um, the, the hierarchy of the Catholic Church, I should say. Um, and the kind of the tragedy of Ireland and the the power now that the financial classes, that the bankers and uh, dodgy businessmen have in Ireland is frightening. Um, and so to anyone who might be tempted because of, you know, real concerns and real kind of frustrations, you know, it's, I don't think it is the land of milk and honey over the, over the horizon. Great. Thank you very much, Andrew, uh, a really nice introduction there and a really good reminder actually of what partition partition of a nation actually does it brings to power the most reactionary elements of that nation and they then spend the rest of their political lives and the people who come after them their successors do the same trying to hang on to power in their little bit and how do they do that how do you hold power in a small pond you tell the people that everyone around them is their enemy you only, not only do we see this in Ireland, what happened to India? When India was, was forcibly partitioned by the British, the British partitioned Ireland, the British partitioned India for a reason, to keep the people weak. And we must bear that in mind, learn the lessons of history. The people have been kept weak in a huge country like India with so many people, with so much natural resources. Those people have been kept hating one another and 75 years after independence, they don't have electricity and running water and education for every child. But British imperialism is still looting the wealth of India. Ask yourself how that happened, because there was potential there for a strong socialist India also. Why did it not happen? Why did India not become like China? They were further de de developed than China at the time of the Chinese re revolution. And yet look where they are now compared to China and ask yourself if China could have done the same if it was fragmented into tiny pieces. You know, we have to understand what it means to balkanize a country. It means you have the most reactionary elements teaching you to hate one another. And how do we define any of these concepts? What the flip is the North? Where is it? Who is it? Actually, it's like a, it's a, it's a cultural concept that we sort of talk about, like we know, but what happens when we start arguing about where the border is? What happens when we start arguing about who counts as a northerner? Actually take yourself into that place and think about what that means and what you're unleashing amongst people who have been integrated for hundreds of years. What are you asking them to do? 
I'm going to introduce you now to another northerner, uh, Helen Sutcliffe. Uh, you'll have seen her as well if you're a regular watcher of our uh, panel shows. Uh, Helen uh, is in near Halifax, is that right, Helen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> West Yorkshire, born and bred. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank, yes, thank you to the Workers' Party for allowing me to, you know, take part in this discussion tonight. And it's a really important one. Um, and it's great to be here. And I hadn't heard of Northern Independence, actually, until I've seen it crop up recently on social media, on Twitter and, and Facebook and what have you. And I've thought, what's this? Obviously, I've heard of Scottish independence and, and, and Welsh, to a certain extent, wanting, you know, their independence and what have you. Um, and I, they're divisive enough, but at least their countries. As Jyoti says, how do you <laughs> work out what region? I mean, where does it stop at your front door? You know, we're going to get to the stage where <laughs> I, I am an island, you know. And, and this is me. I, I'm independent from the rest of the UK in my flat here, my attic flat here above my shop. Not my shop, somebody else's shop. Um, and it's this idea is for the birds. I can't, I, it's just another wild goose chase, something to get everybody talking focusing on instead of focusing on what they should be it's an absolute as Jyoti says absolute gift to the uh, ruling classes is something like this because it keeps the focus off them and the dodgy things that they're doing and keeps the focus on uh, ridiculous things that are never going to work even if you did manage to make them happen how many decades would you spend you know, trying to work it out and get people on board and get the public. The, po the public aren't there. What is the point? You know, there is no... But there is a danger, as you've alluded to, that the public are going to, you know... Because, as Tess said, Jeremy Corbyn did give us all a lot of hope and the Corbyn project and things, you know, and those of you that are around my age and grew up with meatloaf and whatnot, you'll, you'll know this phrase when I say, you know, people are all revved up with no place to go now after the Corbyn thing. And yes, they're going to get on these whims and, and anything that, you know, they can, that, that they can latch onto that makes them give, uh, you know, have some hope back again because they have lost that hope. It, is, it was absolute, this is not said enough, it was absolutely devastating for so many people when the Corbyn project collapsed so bitterly and so cruelly, you know, because of the Brexit thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, I had so much in common with my sisters and brothers in London, in Birmingham, in the Midlands, in Scotland, in Wales everywhere you know why would i want to turn my back on them why would anybody it's ridiculous okay thank you brilliant thank you helen and um you really remind us there that the the way that people felt about corbyn was very real but also what the corbyn project and its collapse taught us was there are no shortcuts to building a real socialist alternative. We won't get socialism through the Labour Party, no matter how much we wish that it would be true. We won't get socialism by breaking Britain into tiny little fragments, no matter how much we wish that it would be true. To, to me, when I see people jumping on this bandwagon, what I see is people, yes, they're looking for hope, but they're also looking for shortcuts. They see the magnitude of the job that lies in front of us, and they're scared and they go, whoo, that, like, that looks overwhelming. British imperialism seems so strong. And yet British imperialism is scared. If it wasn't scared, it wouldn't be funding and pushing and promoting all these different separatist movements at us. It's worried. I mean, these are things which 10, 15, 20, 40 years ago would have seemed like a Monty Python sketch. 
what are you talking about northern independence independence for tooting that was the slogan of a you know a sitcom wasn't it and soon it's going to be the slogan of a real party somewhere right but this is not an accident the ruling class is actually worried they're in a state of crisis they are failing to deliver for the mass of the poor, the mass of the workers of this country, even the middle classes under, you know, increasing pressure, middle class, you know, I mean, the more privileged workers, right? The increasing numbers of people see that tomorrow offers far less than yesterday. Increasing numbers of school children feel that there's nothing waiting for them. There's no prospects like we used to talk about, you know, do well in school, you'll have good prospects. They can see that that isn't true. You know, the future does look bleak to a lot of people. But the, the enemy we have to fight is not as strong as we think it is. We allow it to feel like it's all powerful and then we refuse to try to take it on. But the Workers' Party is here precisely to break that myth, to show us our strength, to organize us together so we can start the real job, which is the only job there is left to do. Capitalism exists. Capitalism has developed to its fullest possible extent. It is decrepit. It is in its dying, moribund, decrepit stage, but it needs an almighty push to get rid of it. We have to make the force that can give that push. We can only do it together. It's strength in numbers. And the ruling class know that we have strength in numbers and they're desperate to stop us from knowing it, sending us off into our tiny little groups. And you're right, Helen, you know, the, the epitome for them is the party of one with, who, with whose program you are 100% in agreement. <laughs> There'll be no disagreements if you just make a party by yourself and a little state in your own flat. Um, so finally, I want to introduce to you guys, Ian Mulholland. Uh, I think uh, Ian's definitely in Scotland. I think near Glasgow, is that right, Ian? Yeah, that's right, Joey. Uh, thanks, thanks for that. Um, you forgive me if I feel there's an element of Groundhog Day uh, with all this for me being up here. This conversation about separatism, you know, I laughed when I saw your tweet. You, you actually responded to to one of the the Northern Independence. And, and I won't lie, I, I haven't been following much a lot this week. I've been in the midst of moving home with my, my pregnant wife and it's been all hands to the pump. So you can imagine when I opened my Twitter feed to, to find a northern independence movement, I thought I'd moved into a dystopian nightmare. Uh, I'm not quite sure what seems to be happening. Now, up here in Scotland unless you've been living under a rock, I'm sure you're all aware. This is a conversation that has consumed, consumed the public, the electorate, the conversation, the media for the last, you know, the, the referendum was 2014, but the conversation has been happening since, I would say, 2007, 2008, you know, since the SNP got their government. And Although we laugh and, and, you know, we're trying to take it with a pinch of salt, you know, Northern independence, as ludicrous as it sounds, but what it is promoting is separatist ideologies, which is exactly what the ruling class and these people want amongst us, the working class. They want us talking about this. They want us so distracted by constitutional issues. I mean, constitutional issues for the North of England. I mean, it's just, it, it beggars belief. It beggars belief. Now, I get and I understand because I'm here. I've lived it. I've lived it the last 14 years. I've seen it. And believe it or not, I, I actually understand and, and maybe empathise with some of these dissenters who seem to be attracted because there's, there's a seduction of it. There's a complete seduction of that. Well, if we just cut them off, all the problems will be solved, you know, but what they're going to do, unfortunately, is lead you down the garden path. And it's not going to be the Garden of Eden. It's a swamp. Trust me, it's a swamp. We have been arguing over this conversation now and continued since 2014. Yet we have the worst drug death rate in Europe here in Scotland. Child poverty in Glasgow in Nicola Sturgeon's own constituency 
is at a ridiculous level and the attainment gap gets bigger. And these are the conversations we need to be having. The separatist ideologies and this conversation is all a distraction to take us away from what we really need to be talking about is uniting the working class. It's as simple as that. So my advice to everybody is, you know, whilst I've been there, I've seen that seduction of let's create this socialist utopia. Independence of any form is not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve that problem. Us uniting, working together is the solution, not dividing us. So to, to kind of cap it all off and really just give you my two cents worth, you know, that was me 11 years ago or so. I thought, you know, that I'll buy into that. No more Westminster elite. Sign me up to that. That, that, sounds, that sounds perfect. But as the years and years have went on, and this, this did just start off as a small idea, but it's grew into something quite, quite nasty and divisive here in Scotland. And my concern is that although we laugh and, and kind of look at this in a flippant manner at times, this Northern independence, this could be planting the seed for division for many years to come. So it's important that we nip that in the bud and we send the message clear that separatism is not what unites us. As simple as that sounds. So workers of the world unite, not separate. That's my message. Absolutely brilliant, Ian. Thank you. And you remind us of the importance of understanding what the real issues are and also the importance of language. You know, um, we talk about, and there's a, there's a tendency amongst people who hate capitalism to forget that it's capitalism that they hate. We're encouraged by our media to do a shorthand, which is in fact a very confusing shorthand. We talk about London, we talk about the South, we talk about Westminster. What we mean is the capitalist state, the capitalist ruling class. But because we don't say those things, it becomes much easier to confuse us about who our enemy is. So you live in the North and you say, oh, them down there in London, but London has huge numbers of very poor working class people. London has some of the worst poverty. London has poverty side by side with incredible wealth. And the poor of London are absolutely shut out from the wealth of London. You know, there are places in London where Poor people live in estates where not a single shop in their area is one that they can go shopping in, you know, because everything around their estate has all been, gent all the nice Victorian houses have been gentrified and done up and all the cafes have, you know, the prices have gone up and, uh, you know, uh, they're all full of people who can afford to be there. And, you know, the, the, the estate kids, they've got nothing and nowhere to go. You know, London is full of that kind of, of poverty side by side with wealth. So the idea that, you know, free ourselves from London from the South, you know, it's, it's meaningless. And it, this terminology hides from people the real problem. We have a class society. What are our real problems? You know, you've, you've talked about them there, Ian, and you're absolutely right. We, our class problems are that we have huge and rising poverty, huge and rising inequality, huge and rising gap between you know, kind of educational attainment, housing issues, with a huge housing crisis that's going on. Uh, we have all these real problems. We, increasingly, people don't have proper jobs. They don't have meaningful employment. They don't have decent pay terms, conditions, holiday pay, sick pay. They can't make ends meet. They can't feed their families. Hunger, destitution, these are things which are rising exponentially, so rapidly in our country, despite the fact that it is the inheritor of the British Empire, British imperialism still brings a huge amount of wealth into this country and workers in this country also produce a huge amount of wealth for the people who they work for. There is capital sloshing around in this country and yet the workers see less and less and less of it 
And all the social provision that was made for us since World War II has been gradually chipping away, you know, our parks, our sports centers, our community facilities, our access to music lessons and theater trips. And, you know, from one end of, the, of society to the other, it's all being taken away and we're left stressed, overworked, underpaid, trying to make ends meet. These problems are the problems of capitalism. They're the problems of living in a capitalist state um, where inequality is built into the system, poverty, unemployment, housing crises, these are built into the system of capitalism. And we are not addressing those when we divert people with this idea of, you know, uh, a separate North, a separate Essex, a separate Wales, you know, in those separatisms, we will be asked to identify with everyone from that area, no matter what class they are, and encouraged to uh, feel hostility towards everyone from outside that area, no matter what class they are. There is nothing progressive in that. There is no way forward for us in that. We have to understand that. Um, guys, I don't see any of you, ah, oh, Tess. Tess wants to come back in, great. You can always count on me to talk, I think. <laughs> um, a lot of what's made separatism more popular lately is, of course, the COVID crisis, because the different countries have been running their devolved ways, doing things differently. So Wales have been responding differently to England. And so that's started a load of arguments for starters. And it's also made a big deal of borders. So it's like, you know, you, you read the comments on Facebook uh, the other day when all the cars were coming in um, down into Carmarthen and there's footage of it and everyone's freaking out going, oh, here they come, the crockles, they're going to bring their COVID and we're all going to die. And, and, and there's the other thing as well of people think, um, they get really angry with people moving in from away from England or whatever, who are able to sell their houses for a lot of money and then move here and buy a great big house in the country and buy up all the farms. And, you know, as locals, we can't do that. So there's a certain amount of jealousy that we can't, but it's not the people who have moved here's fault that capitalism works in a way that makes their house suddenly worth tons and tons of money and the, and the houses down here worth relatively less and you know it's got to the point now in Cornwall where houses are so expensive like holiday homes or second homes or whatever have put the house prices up so far that now people are coming over to Wales and the Gower and Pembrokeshire and they're all kind of moving here now so that's causing resentment but that's that's a problem with the housing structure and with the capitalist structure and with an inequality structure that's nothing to do with with individuals coming and being invaders you know it's not an iron maiden song you know so um it, helen made me laugh because the other day i was joking and saying i'm going to form the six foot within my kettle party because sometimes you just feel like that don't you and i can see why people just want to switch off i mean i lived in a field alone like pretty much for six years and uh, it, you know I, you try and escape of course you try and escape and that that feeling that you want to pull up the drawbridge and no 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 horrid stuff go away that's that's a, a really natural feeling so I kind of get it but I don't want us to return to the sort of Saxon kings the ancient kingdoms of Wessex Mercy and Northumbria and Anglia all fighting and ah, the Dane law and Vikings killing Saxons and Saxons killing Celts and Celts killing ancient Britons you know this thing there's this map that goes round and it's got sort of like Britain cut in half down the middle and there's all the Celtic nations are all on the left. Way Celtic nations. But like Boudicca lived, like she was the queen of Iceni. She lived in Anglia and the Celts didn't come from Britain. They came from sort of like Eastern Europe somewhere and came over and sort of invaded Northern, the, 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 the ancient Britons. And then the Saxons kind of beat up the Celts and then the Vikings beat up the Saxons. It's like, you know, we don't want to return to that, do we? Seriously, it's, um, you know, it, Imperialism, I know everyone hates imperialism because we went round and we colonised the world and caused loads of aggro, but that wasn't England, that was Britain. That, there were plenty of Scottish and Welsh people involved in all of that. It's, we're not the pure forms of British, <laughs> you know, it's, like, it's not like England, cruel, Wales, lovely. It's not like that. And as Ian was saying, I, I can't bear the thought of wasting the next 15 years going on and on and on about separatism in Wales. I can't bear it if that's what it's going to be like. I, I, I don't know, I might have to go back to my field. <laughs> um, but all this thing as well, also they say, um, we want the Tories out and we're Labour. 
However, the, the red wall up, up north, they voted Tory in the last election, didn't they? And uh, London voted Labour. <laughs> so that's all to, to cock as well. And um, the, the, Bre the, the Hartlepool by-election that's coming up, I mean, talk about miss the point. Hartlepool voted 67% leave in the Brexit election. So like the Northern Independence Party and Labour have both put up candidates who are real Remainers. <laughs> so that to me, I mean, it's making no sense at all whatsoever to me that, so um, yeah, you, you, gotta, you, you know, you're saying you're doing one thing, but you're doing another, but be clear at least. <laughs> thanks. Brilliant, thanks Tess. Andrew wants to come back in. Yeah, um, there, was a, there was a good point raised just before there about um, uh, British imperialism, about it being British and not just uh, specifically English. And something that's often forgot is that one of the first imperialist ventures um, actually came from uh, Scotland when there was it was still an independent kingdom. Um, and that kind of makes me think about um, something that has been mentioned a few times tonight. Um, about the divisions that the ruling class um, like to put between us. And um, uh, I remember watching a, a thing from uh, Mark Steele once, and he was being um, interviewed about different things. And anyway, he'd been up uh, in Glasgow and he was talking about going to Edinburgh. And I can't remember the exact quote, but he was talking to this bloke and he said, uh, oh, yeah, you don't want to go down to Edinburgh, you know, full of middle class and, uh, you know, stuck up people and... And he says, well, you know, they can't all be like that. I mean, surely there's got to be, uh, you know, bin men and things like that. And apparently he said, uh, I, we stuck up middle class bin men. Um, and there is this kind of, <laughs> there is this kind of ridiculous separation between us, you know, because of course there's not, you know, middle class bin men in, uh, in Edinburgh, you know, there is working class people in Edinburgh and there's rich people in Edinburgh and there's exploiters and exploited. Um, just as much as any other part of um, the UK. And it is true, yes, it, it's better to pick us off. It's you put us into a small group and you say this is a, this nation or this race or where God's chosen or whatever. Um, and then, uh, I mean, something Jody said before about how, you know, if say, there was Northern independence, that irrespective of uh, somebody's class, you would have to identify with them. Well, absolutely not. I don't identify with the uh, the capitalists of uh, the North any more than I do with the capitalists of the South or East or West or anywhere else for that matter. Um, and there was a, a quote, actually another quote from James Connolly that came to mind, um, which is that the socialist of another country is a fellow patriot as the capitalist of my own country is a natural enemy. Um, and so that's on that point. And just a little... Um, thing because something that was mentioned about uh, where is the north, where does it start and I know the the NIP with their whippet symbol um, have uh, talked about the old kingdom of Northumbria and restoring the old borders um, well I can see the danger of maybe a, a touch of uh, revanchism here because if you look at the old Northumbrian borders it actually stretch all, stretches all the way up into West Lothian and includes Edinburgh. Um, now, don't get us wrong. I mean, it, it might be quite nice to sort of uh, uh, have some of the contributions of Edinburgh, but I don't know how uh, how the people of Edinburgh would think about being incorporated into an independent Northumbria. But um, but again, it's, it's the absurdity of this kind of separatism and, as I say, as I say the division that um, that they make because it's it's better for the ruling class. That's exactly right, Andrew. Thank you. And you know, on the on the question of um, you know the fight over borders, it reminds me very much. Um, hang on, I'm going to ask. Yeah, you have muted. So why am I not showing up as the main thing? Sorry, Rob. I feel like I'm not the picture. I am the picture. I haven't got a yellow screen around me. You're but fine, Josie. Yeah. I'll just carry on then. Sorry, guys. I thought I was talking and you were looking at someone else. So. Um, yeah, it reminds me very much of the, the situation uh, among the Sikh separatists. When I was uh, growing up in the 80s, there was a big movement among the Sikhs of Punjab for a Sikh state, 
Now the Sikhs are not a nation, they are a religion, but for the purposes of this particular separatism, they tried to claim nationhood and they tried to claim all of Punjab as theirs. Punjab, of course, is only partially now in India. The rest of it is in Pakistan. In India, um, Punjab is occupied by Sikhs, Hindus and Muslims, always was. Um, it is, has been divided into two states again. But of course, they didn't even look at the modern Punjabi kind of state, which they couldn't really lay claim to because it's not only Sikhs who live there, but they tried to say it was theirs. Then they started fighting over, well, actually, what we're really talking about is Greater Punjab, i.e. the furthest extent that its borders ever reached to at the time of one particular leader. Uh, his name was Ranjit Singh, and uh, he conquered a huge area of that, he, that then became Punjab for a little while until the British then conquered them. But here's the thing, you're always gonna get that. So the people who say, let's bring back the Northumbrian borders, Northumbria's borders never stayed still. So they're gonna pick the widest possible borders. But then what about Mercia? If Mercia decides it wants its widest possible borders, everyone wants their widest possible borders. Can you see where that goes? Can you just understand the logic of what is happening if we allow ourselves to go down such a ridiculous and obviously Monty Python path? Um, I do feel like it's Monty Python. It does seem like we shouldn't have to say these things. They're so obvious. But when the ruling class decides to put funding and turn something silly into a fashion, it's amazing how it gathers steam. And you only have to look at the fact that it's now hate speech to say that a man isn't a woman to realize how absurd things can become when they have enough funding and how dangerous they can come become when they have enough funding. You know, remember that jihadis in Afghanistan did were just wandering clerics who people thought were lunatics and ignored until they got loads of money and weapons from the CIA it, to destabilize, destabilize um, a socialist leaning Afghanistan, a secular government in that country. You know, things that sit, appear ridiculous to the mass of people can gather a head of steam when they've got backing of finance and logistics behind them. And that's the, that's the worry for us. That's the potential for that to happen is there. And we mustn't kid ourselves that it isn't. It's not a meaningful solution. It's not a serious idea, but it can be made to look slick and serious with enough of an injection of cash, with enough media coverage, you will notice that this type of thing will get much more coverage, although it doesn't really have the support or interest of the mass of the people, doesn't represent what they need, than the Workers' Party who continue to be blocked out of every media coverage, whose kind of all our algorithms are capped and squashed our followers are kicked off our accounts on social media that's supposed to be so open you know we are not acknowledged george is standing um and the alliance for unity standing in all of the list seats in scotland they're not getting any coverage on the bbc you know the blackout on solutions which are meaningful will continue while publicity and money will continue to go to things which are ridiculous but are useful for diverting our attention. Uh, I can see that Ian's got his hand up there. Come on in, Ian. Joey, you've, you've really just echoed my thoughts exactly there. Um, you know, these things start off small. Um, with the backing and the funding and the support, it becomes then noticeable. It's a, I can't remember how they, how they term it. It's first they joke about you, then they ignore you, and then the next thing you know, they're discrediting you. And, and that's how these things progress. But I, I suppose that there'll be people watching this maybe on the fringes who maybe aren't members, maybe watching this on, you know, YouTube, whatever it may be, uh, following the broadcast. And I, I think it's important as well that we, we put the message out to you there that are watching that, you know, although we can laugh and joke about this, um, there's a serious issue here and that, this is a plan to divide us all. And the Workers' Party is the only party that's speaking about national unity for the workers. And we want you to, to, to take that on board, check us out and come and join us in that. 
it's very hard for me, particularly when I fight the candidacy, the candidacy up here with George for the All for Unity um, election campaign. Uh, I can't in good faith support a movement that promotes separatism. You know, when you call for, you know, comrades, unite, you know, you know, help us, you know, and try and achieve our goals, it's very contradictory for me to stand and shout about, you know, bringing the country together and then on the other hand support a cause that separates that. So check us out. Come and join the real working class movement here in Britain and keep away from the separatist politics that is exactly that, designed to break us up and separate us. Beautiful, thank you, Ian. So I don't see any other hands up. Anybody come back in before I finish? I'll go on, Helen. Yes, I'll just, just say briefly, you know, if people want to be, if they want that camaraderie within the community and they want to have that sort of solidarity with people close to them and the neighbours and things, we used to have street parties and things like that when I was a kid. You know, I am going back <laughs> a fair way, granted, but they don't seem to happen anymore. And, you know, it was things like that where people used to talk to each other and people used to share their common worries and their common problems and issues and things. There, were, there was a real sense of community in those days. And we need to get back to these days. This is where we can be talking to each other. This is where, you know, it's, it's these community events and, and people um, organising just within their own street, if one person went down their own street and, and spread the word, for example, about um, uniting the working classes and how, you know, we can come together to fight the establishment and things like that, and, and it has a knock-on effect. We don't need to wait for the Jeremy Corbyns and the Bernie Sanderses to come along, do we? We can be our own heroes and be out on the doorsteps and talking to each other. Um, that Because that's where it, it, it's at. I've heard you say it before, Jyoti. You know, politics is not always sexy and glamorous. It's the, it's the nitty-gritty stuff that's important. The wearing out of the shoe leather and, and the, you know... And talk to everyone, not just those that agree with you. That's really important. You know, there may be things you disagree with, you know, if people are coming out with bigoted or racist things or what you perceive as that. Find something that you do have in common, you know, because then further down the line, when you've got that camaraderie going on and that you've got that trust for each other and you've stood on picket lines together and you've stood in protests or whatever together, then's the time to speak about other issues and maybe persuade each other and maybe, you know, because you've got that rapport going on with each other. But uh, division, wrong way, no, unity. That, that's the thing, you know. Thank you. Brilliant, Helen. Well, that's a perfect note, I think, to end on. You know, you've reminded us that to bring workers together, we have to physically be with them. We have to be with one another. And the whole mission of the Workers' Party is to build a real, a real organisation of people on the ground who working class people know in their communities. We need to build a huge network of people who are prepared to do that unglamorous work of wearing out their, their shoe le leather around their communities, giving out leaflets, talking to people, building a relationship between the party and the people that the party hopes to represent and to recruit, because it's both, right? We're recruiting workers to represent workers, right? And we have to do that with work, but it's the work that needs to be done and therefore it's fulfilling, useful, interesting work. It's work where you will have a sense of camaraderie. You'll have a sense of there is some meaning in your life when you do this work. You know why you're doing it. You're doing it for your class. You're doing it for the future, not just of yourself, but of your children, of your grandchildren, of the planet, of all the things that actually matter, right? This work has to be done. So join us and help us do it and let us, Take away one message from tonight. If it didn't come home to you already, I'll just repeat it again. 
separatism, nationalism of all kinds, they are reactionary. Reactionary means turning the wheel of history backwards. Socialism is progressive because it turns the wheel of history forwards. We have reached the final stage of capitalist development. There's nowhere for capitalism to go except to go into socialism. We have to do the work to get us there, the work to build a mass organization of the working class, which is able to harness the power that the workers have. And our power is in strength of numbers. The ruling class knows it. We have to learn it too.